Well, amen. Praise the Lord. Turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Now, we've had a wonderful time in his presence this morning, praising him, thanking him, rejoicing, shouting just a little bit. And I hope in a few minutes you'll be just as happy and rejoicing and shouting as we examine the Word of God. <laughs> I got one. I am a college football fan. A fan is defined as an enthusiastic admirer. And even more specifically, I am an LSU college football fan. <laughs> hey, I know how to get response in a service. I know how to do it. <laughs> Matter of fact, I have a, a hoodie that when the weather's right and I'm watching a ball game, I put that hoodie on, say LSU on the front of it. And all while I'm watching that game, my language starts to change just a little bit. And I start thinking about crawfish and shrimp and boudreaux and tibido. I enjoy a little trash talking every now and then, too. I can tell you that in this last season, LSU won every game but two. Now, you notice I didn't say they lost two games. I said they won every game except two. And I know who they lost to. I know who the teams that were that beat them, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> and certainly, we're not going to discuss the bowl games on, on New Year's Eve. We're not going to talk about that either. You know why? Because I'm a fan. I'm an LSU fan. But I'll tell you what I'm not. I'm not an LSU follower. And what I mean by that is, I've never been to Death Valley. Never been to a ball game in the LSU stadium. Never watched one in person. And you know what? You will never see me sitting at a ball game of any kind with an umbrella. Because if it's raining, I'm not going. <laughs> you will not see me at a ball game all hunkered up with a blanket pulled over me and, and thing wrapped, because I'm not going to do it. I am a fair weather fan. Just that simple. It's way too easy to sit in my living room and watch it than have to fight the crowds. Now, we had in our previous church, uh, the social pastor at that time, he was an LSU follower. And there were times that he would leave Saturday afternoon. If they were playing Saturday night, he would drive two and a half hours to Baton Rouge, and he would go to that game, and soon he would stay to the very last second and then exit with those 90,000 plus people to the parking lot, get in their car. It'd take an hour just to get out of town, just to get out of Baton Rouge to take over an hour. He'd get home at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning knowing he had an 8 o'clock service coming because he's a follower. I've never painted my face purple and gold. <laughs> I cannot name for you today the starting lineup. I do not know who Coach Miles is recruiting for next season. I don't even know their, their stats. I barely know the quarterback's name, but I have no idea what his, his passing record is. His statistics, I have no idea. All I knew is for about half the season, I didn't like him very much. You will not walk into my home nor my office and immediately go, oh, he's an LSU fan. You won't do it. I, I just, I don't, you know, I'm a fan, but I'm not a follower like that. I don't, I don't put things up. Now, now, Brother Lance, however, he's a, he's a fan of NASCAR. He's around here somewhere. Not only is he a fan, he's a follower. His favorite driver is number 24. He goes at least once a year, and he watches 
them go around in a circle, round and around and around. <laughs> Matter of fact, the first time I went to his office downtown, there's a huge race car tire sitting in the corner in his office with the number 24 plastered everywhere. If you walk by him today, get him to pull his keychain out. It says 24. It has a car on it. It says 24. You know why? He's, he's a follower. I said all that to say this. I believe it could be accurately stated that in the vast majority of our churches, the vast majority of our people sitting in our churches are fans of Christ. But they are not followers. They have a church they belong to and attend activities from time to time. They have a Bible, but sometimes they can hardly find it when they're getting ready to leave for church, or sometimes they have to get in their car and turn around and go back and get it because they have forgotten. They can talk about Jesus and even share a time when they pray to prayer and ask Jesus to come into their heart. They can certainly tell you how long they've been attending their church, and they can tell you how long their parents attended their church, and probably take their grandparents all the way back to their charter members of the church they belong to. They have fond memories of church events like the day they were baptized or maybe even the day they were married. They might even have a favorite pastor or preacher that they remember growing up that helped them, befriended them, or even led them to Christ. But if you go deeper than that, if you go beyond the surface things of Christianity, with the vast majority of our people inhabiting our churches, you will find that they do not have a growing, deepening relationship with Christ. You see, you can be a Christian and not be a disciple. I want you to keep that in mind this morning. You can be a Christian and not be a disciple. We have far too many fans, not nearly enough followers. If you were to look in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark and see how Jesus called his disciples, you would find uh, that as uh, the, their account of it is as he was walking along, he called to Simon and Andrew, and he called to James and John, and he said, come follow me. And the Bible says in the Gospels of, of Matthew and Mark that they left their nets and they followed Christ. But you find something in the book of Luke that you don't find in the other two gospels, the previous two gospels, because Luke was a doctor, number one. He gave a little more detail as the Spirit of God gave him to write. And if you look in Luke chapter 5, I want you to notice something. Luke chapter 5 and verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Genesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. You know what he's saying? Jesus, I'm the fisherman. You're the teacher. Teachers teach. Fishermen fish. I don't tell you how to teach. Don't tell me how to fish. Okay, that's a little liberal translation, but that's basically what he's saying was, I'm, I'm the master fisherman, but out of respect, that's what he goes on to say, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Out of respect for you as a teacher, then I will do so. And then you see what happens. When they had done this, verse 6, when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, noticed the change, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. You see, he's, he had a revelation. Jesus was a greater man than he thought he was. He underestimated the man who was teaching from the bow of his boat. And when he saw Jesus, he got a glimpse of himself. He saw who he was. Verse 9, For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Keep that in mind. 
And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Verse 11. So when they had brought their boats to the land, they forsook all and followed him. First of all, Peter saw something in Christ that he had not seen previously. You see, I personally believe Peter believed. When he said, I can't be near you, I can't be in your prayer, I'm sinful. You see, suddenly it had nothing to do with fish. It had to do with him. And then when Jesus said, and of course the other uh, gospels said that Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And the Bible says here in verse 11 that they forsook all and followed him. They left it all. Now, I've looked at, at all the translations, not all the translations, but all the gospels in looking at this. And the one thing that popped in my mind just about every time as I'm reading this story is, what were their fathers thinking? This is a family business. This is Andrew and Simon and their father. And then they had a partner, Zebedee and his sons, James and John. And Jesus comes by and says to the, to the four boys, hey, come follow me. And they left. They left. What, what was the daddy thinking? Tony Evans, in his book, Kingdom Man, said this statement. He said, many of the disciples dropped their nets to follow Jesus. We can hardly get men to drop their remotes to follow him today. And then we wonder why we're not seeing more of heaven on earth and why our wives are not supportive or willing to submit. Jesus said it like this. If you look over a couple of chapters in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. And follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. We have a lot of fans. But not many followers. You know why? Salvation is absolutely free to us. It cost Jesus his life. But he paid the price so that we might be saved. And we love to talk about salvation, and I do. I love to rejoice over the fact that I, I'm a sinner, worthless and vile, and Jesus saved me. But salvation is a starting point. Salvation was free. Discipleship will cost you something. So what does it mean to be a disciple of Christ? What does it mean to be a follower of the Lord Jesus? Oswald Chambers said, salvation and sanctification are the work of God's sovereign grace. Our work as his disciples is to disciple lives until they are wholly yielded to God. A disciple is defined as a follower and a student of Jesus Christ. But being a disciple is more than just having received salvation from Christ. It's the starting point. It's where we begin. But it's possible to be a child of God and not be a disciple of Christ. We can live the Christian life with the assurance of heaven as our ultimate destiny, but miss the process of maturing as a disciple. I'm sure you have seen or have known of people who, because of some physical issue in their life, they have gotten older in age, but not in maturity. But they can't help it because of an issue, a health issue. But I'm sure we have all met and known and maybe even had to deal with people who are getting older in age but refuse to grow up. Anybody? I mean, there were times in my life my parents would say to me, hey, Shannon, you are such and such age. It's time for you to start acting like it. It's time for you to grow up. Paul said the very same thing to the Corinthians. He said, I'm not giving you meat, I'm feeding you milk because you're not ready for meat. You should be ready for meat, but you're not. It's time to grow up. You see, being a disciple involves becoming a learner, a student of the master. You see, we don't like to be learners, we just want to be teachers. 
We don't want to be followers. We just want to be leaders. But you will never make a leader unless you're a follower. You can never be used of God to disciple people unless you're a disciple yourself. A disciple's desire is to be just like his master. The mean, that means studying his word, absorbing his teaching. You must learn about the one you are to follow and equip yourself to the work he'll direct you to. A disciple is a follower of Christ. This means you take on his priorities as your own. You take on his agenda as your agenda. You take on his mission as your mission. Where he leads, you follow. That's what it means to be a disciple. But I want to show you that Jesus states very clearly in the scriptures how we are to be his disciple, what it takes for a believer to be a disciple. The things that we must do. You see, salvation is a sovereign work of grace of, uh, of God in our hearts, but discipleship is a choice. You will choose to walk and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So four things I want you to see this morning of how we become disciples, things that we must do to be disciples. Number one, nothing else comes first. Nothing else comes first. He said there in chapter 9 and verse 23, if anyone desires to come after me, anyone wants to follow me, anyone wants to be my disciple, let him deny himself. Let him deny himself. And then verse 24, whoever desires to save his life, if you're more interested in your life, you're going to lose it. But whoever will lose his life, whoever will turn it over to the Lord Jesus, he said, you will save it. To be a disciple of Christ means that nothing else is in front of following him. Matter of fact, if you'll turn a few chapters forward to chapter 14, Luke chapter 14, In verse 25, I want you to notice how Jesus addresses the multitude. Chapter 14, verse 25, it says, Now a great multitude went with him, and he turned to him and said to them. Now I want you to notice that, because here is Jesus. Now, obviously, he's not like us. There's a great crowd following him. And our thought process and our humanity and our logical thinking would say, whatever you have to do to keep the crowd following you, then that's what you do. Whatever's going to keep them right there, that's what you want to do. But Jesus didn't think like that. Jesus turned to them and in the next verse said to them, verse 26, if anyone comes to me, and the idea is following me or being my disciple to learn after me, and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, can you imagine that? This great crowd is following him, and instead of wanting to be a people pleaser, so he can keep the crowd, he turns to them and said, now, I just want y'all to understand something. If you're going to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, you're going to need to hate your family and yourself as well. You say, did he mean really to hate? Well, the language, the text, the context would be, you can't put them in front of me. You can't put them in front of me. He said, if anybody's going to come after me, if you're going to be a disciple, a follower of Christ, nothing can come between me and you. Nothing else can come first. I mean, consider that. If we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's leading, we're following. Uh, go back to the disciples. When James and John and Peter and Andrew, Jesus come, comes by and says, hey, come follow me. And they forsake all. Can you imagine? They're leaving the family business. They're leaving the security. It wasn't just their choice alone. They're affecting their family. This isn't just affecting their own walk with God. This is affecting everybody who's around them. And they're leaving. Can you imagine the fathers running after them going, hey, boys, wait a second. Jesus is walking this way. He's told them to come follow me. They're following. They're heading that way. And the father comes running up going, hey, whoa, whoa you can't leave. This is a family business. This is the way we've always done things. This is traditional. Your, your grandfather taught me how to fish. Your great-grandfather taught me how to fish. You're supposed to take over the business. 
But I can't. Jesus said to follow him, I'm going to follow him. See, nothing else can come first. And that's why Jesus said, then you have to look at your family and say, I have to obey God first. And if they get in the way, you better obey God. If they get in the way, you better keep walking. And that's why Jesus is saying, number one, yourself cannot get in the way. Your own wants and desires, your own feelings, your own flesh, you're going to deny. If you want to do what I tell you to do, then you have to follow me. You can't let your family get in the way. If I've told you to come over here and your family's going, hey, you're crazy, that doesn't make sense, don't do that, that's not the way you ought to live, we didn't raise you to act like that, we didn't teach you to do those kinds of things, how are you going to support your family? How are you going to take care of the things you're supposed to take care of? Well, I don't know. God just told me to do this. Well, and he said, if you don't hate your family in the sense that they're second, you cannot be my disciple. Did you hear what he said? You cannot. Impossible. You cannot be my disciple. Nothing comes first besides the Lord. Nothing else can come in front of him. Deny self. Deny everything else with, that would say, don't do what God says. Throw it all away and follow him. Number two, nothing else can be considered. He said there in chapter 9 in verse 23, take up your cross daily and follow me. In chapter 14, in verse 27, he said, whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, again, these must have been strange words to the multitude. You have to remember that we are on this side of Calvary. We understand what the cross meant. We understand what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus hadn't been on the cross yet when he said these words. All they knew was the cross was, number one, was shame and humiliation. It was punishment. It was death. And Jesus looked at them and said, you should take up your cross, your cross, daily. In a sense, what he was saying was, it may look to everybody else that what I've told you to do is humiliating. You may look to everybody else around you like such a shame. What a waste. Such a shame. He said, if you're going to be my disciple, it cannot matter what everybody else thinks. If you're going to be my disciple, it is a daily choice. He said, take up your cross every day. Every day, pick up your cross and keep right on walking. Follow me. And he said, if you're unwilling to carry the cross of which I have given you, then you can't be my disciple. You cannot. Nothing else can be considered. Number three, nothing else counts except the cost. Nothing else is counted except the cost. Notice he did not say the assets. He said, count the cost. Matter of fact, he, he describes, he gives a whole uh, description of what he's talking about. How a man, in verse 28, wouldn't build a tower unless he knows first that he can finish it. He's not going to start it unless he knows he's got the money to finish it. Or a king is not going to go to war unless he has uh, carefully examine the troops that he's got, that he can conquer that which he is going to fight, or he's going to send some people along the way and say, hey, let's work out something. You see, what he wasn't saying was, look at the pros and the cons. Because, see, that's how we think. That's how we look at, the, we, we reach a logical conclusion. It's, it, it, there's more for it than against it, so this is going to work out just fine. It's not like buying a car. Well, here's some good qualities about it. Here's some things I don't really like, but I think it, I can get used to that. No, he wasn't asking you to evaluate being a disciple and see whether it's going to all work out right. He said, no, you need to understand what it's going to cost. You say, well, what's it going to cost? Look at verse 33. Unless you're willing to forsake everything you have, you cannot be my disciple. Unless you're willing to give it all up. Unless you're willing to forsake everything, put everything aside, you cannot 
Look at the strong language. You cannot be my disciple. You cannot. He wasn't saying, look at being a disciple and see how it all measures out. No, he said, you need to go and evaluate right now before you take one step and make one decision of being a disciple. You need to understand now, what's it going to cost you? It costs you everything. It's not a popular gospel. You're not drawing a whole lot of crowds with this kind of message. But you see, Jesus was saying this to the crowd. Don't act like you're going to be my disciple. Start. He said, it's worse if you start and then you quit. If you go back and look at the example, he said, just like a man who's going to build a tower, and, and if he doesn't have the money to finish it, then everybody walks by, and he's a laughing stock. See, he didn't, he didn't look. He didn't examine very well. He, he started a building knowing he couldn't complete it. He said, you need to understand. You're going to be my disciple. This is what it's going to cost you. Everything. I wish I could say it stronger. I wish I could make it more plain. It costs you everything. You said, does that mean I have to go sell everything? And, and, and do No, what it means is everything I have, everything I am, everything I will ever be, it is yours. It is yours. You can do with me what you want to do. If you want me to, to do this, I'll go do it. If you want me to get rid of something, I'll get rid of it. Let me ask you something, church. You ever had a time where you're getting ready to do something, and as soon as you got ready to do it, maybe to purchase something or go somewhere or do a certain thing, and the Spirit of God inside of you said, no, 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 mm -mm. Mm -mm. don't do that, don't do that. Logically, it made no sense. Well, what's the harm? Well, I wish I could tell you how many times I've asked myself that question. What's the big deal? Well, the big deal is the Spirit of God inside of me said, don't. I thought, I'll remind you of the Scripture where... Paul was getting ready to go in, into another part of the country to witness and to preach. And he said, we were warned of the Holy Spirit not to go. What's wrong with preaching? Not a thing in this world unless God told you not to. You see, nothing else is considered. Whatever you say, Lord, that's what I'll do. I have forsaken all. That's what verse 33 says, that unless you are willing to give it all up, count the cost, it's going to cost you everything. He wouldn't tell you to evaluate. He wouldn't tell you to look at the pros and cons of being a disciple. He's just straight up saying to you, you're going to follow me? It costs you everything. Your life is not your own. Which would explain why we have more fans than followers. Because when God starts requiring of us what it takes to be a disciple of Christ, we don't want to pay the price. We can say with our lips, I, I want to follow Christ, I love the Lord, I want to be like him, I want to be like Jesus, until he starts putting you to the test. And then you make up your mind. Because you see, that's why he said take up the cross every day. You will make a decision every single day. Today, I'm going to die to myself. Today, I'm going to deny myself. Today, I'm going to take up the cross that God has given me, and I'm going to follow him. Today, I'm going to let God do with me whatever he wants to do. Use me however he chooses, or not use me however he chooses. Nothing else is counted except the cost. And then finally, nothing else controls us. Nothing else controls us. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 31, he said to the Jews who had believed in him, he said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, the truth shall set you free. Two problems that we have, I believe, among our believers today. Number one, we don't want to know the truth. Because truth costs you something. Truth might cause you to change, but it will set you free. But he said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. How often do we, the people of God, the children of God, say, I just don't have time to be in his word. I just don't have time to pray. Do you know what I got going on? Do you know how busy I am? And this is what I would say to you with all the love in my heart. If you are too busy to spend time with God, you are too busy. You are too busy. Because you see, this is what I know about myself. 
And it's what I believe I know about us. We do what we want to. We make time for the things that are important. And Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to be my disciple, how can you lead others in, in, to follow Christ? And how can you be like Christ if you don't know who he is? If you haven't learned. I mean, I have met people who've been married for many, many, many years, and they don't know each other. They live in the same house. They exist, but they don't know each other. You see, there was a day they got married. They don't know each other. I believe we are dealing with far too many people. They met Christ somewhere along the way. They gave their life to Christ, and they've been saved for a very long time, but they've taken no opportunity to know him, to be his disciple. See, the problem is we got a lot of fans, not many followers. Because being a disciple will cost you. But I want to tell you this morning, it is worth the price. It is worth the price. You see, I don't want to stand before God and give an account for my life and God say, you know, I had so much I could have done with you. I had so many things that I intended See, one thing Dad and I talk about all the time is that God, he's looking at the blueprint for our lives. And he sees what he wants to do, what he desires to do. But I would hate for God to say to me, son, I had so much more, but you wouldn't pay for it. You wouldn't pay the price. You wouldn't do what it takes to walk with me and to know me. You were my fan, but you weren't a follower. It's a question we need to ask ourselves this morning, church. Where are we? Are we fans of Christ? Or have we made up our mind, determined we're going to be followers? Let's stand together, please. We're going to take a moment of invitation. Have you made up your mind to be a disciple, a follower? Or are you just content to go through your religious routine? Content to know that when you die, you go to heaven. But I want to tell you something. You can have some heaven here on earth. You can know him. Just like you know your close friends. Hopefully as you know your spouse. In a so much more intimate way, you can know God follow after him but it'll cost you it'll cost you are you willing to pay the price so Brother Shannon you going to give me a list of things you want me to do no and I'm not even trying to put you on any kind of guilt trip today I want you to be obedient to the Holy Spirit of God he can accomplish more with you than anything I could ever say I just want you to know and ask yourself, am I a fan or a follower? Do I think everything about this religious stuff, church stuff, it's all good, makes me feel good? But when I walk out of here, nothing in my life reveals to a dying world that I know the Savior. Only you can answer that question. The altars are open this morning. I'm here if you need me. I pray you be obedient. Father, I thank you for our time together today. And God, I pray you speak exactly what needs to be heard in our hearts this morning. And I pray that, Lord, your people would rise up and say to you, God, whatever it costs, I'll pay it. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I want to be used by you. I'll follow you. Wherever you lead, I'll go. Whatever you say, I'll do. I want to be a disciple a follower of Christ. In Jesus' name.